Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Ballroom Chat podcast and live stream. Uh, thank you for joining us this morning on YouTube. Uh, we switched streaming platforms and we're going to see if this works a little bit better. So if you are tuning in live, welcome. So glad to have you. I am your host, Samantha from Love Live Dance. And today... I have a several times top teacher award winner, a former collegiate assessment director for US ISTD, regional examiner for DeVita, US national pro-am winner for both smooth and standard, uh, world master champion for pro-am smooth and standard, and just an amazing coach, I have Mr. Ian Gillette. <laughs> Thank you very much. What a lovely welcome. I hardly recognize myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you are quite accredited. <laughs> Um, so I am so glad to have you this morning. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about um, the importance of basics and uh, how to continue your dance training while you're at home, as well as some other technical stuff. Um, but before we jump into it, for those that maybe aren't familiar with you or your background, uh, tell us a little bit about how you got started in the industry. Mm. Well, this was quite a long time ago. My father um, at the time worked for a company that had a national chain of menswear stores. And he was progressing through the company and he was offered a big promotion. And the promotion necessitated him being able to drive into the head office, which was based uh, west of London, a place called Ryslip. And my parents lived about two, three hours north of the capital. So my father accepted the new job, and so we moved as a family, and we, well, my parents bought a house in a place called Colnbrook. Now, most people will never heard of Colnbrook at all, but if you've ever flown into or flown out of London Heathrow Airport, Colnbrook is at the end, essentially, of one of the main runways. Okay. Um, so very, very easy, very convenient for actually getting into London um, for lessons because there was, a, there was a motorway called the M4, which took, took you right into the West End. Um, so my parents, anyway, uh, enrolled me in a primary school, which was about, I don't know, five, eight minutes walk from the new house. And in my class was a girl called Sharon. And uh, Sharon actually... Uh, dance. She was a born dancer. And her mum befriended my mum. And Sharon's mum said, oh, why don't you take your Ian for some born dancing lessons? My Sharon, she loves it. So my mum took me for a group class, a children's class on a Saturday afternoon. And I absolutely loved it. And so I went back again and again and ordered some shoes, black patent little shoes, uh, which I just adored. Um, and from there, I started taking uh, private lessons with my first teacher, Sue McGuinness. And uh, I did actually dance with Sharon <laughs> for about six months. So I'm not really sure why the partnership ended. I have a feeling that she moved. Anyway, um, Unbeknownst to me, the, the, the school that Sharon went to, the dancing school, was run by Ken Bateman and Blanche Ingle. And they had a very, very successful school. Um, it was in a place called Slough, and they, they worked out of the Slough Community Centre, which was this sprawling place, um, huge hall that they used for competitions, another um, room, large room that they ran their private lessons and um, their uh, closed school competitions. Another big space for the children's classes. So it was it was a really really good school. And when I kind of talked to you of the of the dancers that came out of that studio, Richard and Janet Leave, um, Alan and Hazel Fletcher, even Jonathan Wilkins, they all came out of Ken and Blanche's school. So it had a very very Good reputation so I was just very very lucky um, that um, just happened to find that that place that studio um, 
So I had a couple of partners from Sharon. I moved on to Tracy and Tracy's parents for sure moved, emigrated to Australia. And then I ended up with a, another girl, girl called Samantha Tiger, unusual name. Um, and I joined the formation team, the juvenile formation team, started competing. Um, and that's when, um, when I was competing at one point, that's when the parents of Carol Dixon, who is my last partner as a juvenile, approached my parents um, and said, oh, you know, would, would I be interested in competing with their daughter? And my parents said yes. And kind of really that kind of catapulted my way up through the juvenile ranks. Um, what was interesting is that Carol's parents, Tony and Chris, were dancers themselves, were professional dancers. Um, good, good standard as well. And Tony had recommended, you know, um, that it would be a good idea to really get some top class coaching. And so Tony somehow approached Brenda Winslade. Now, I don't know if you've heard of Brenda, but Peter Eggleton and Brenda Winslade are icons of ballroom dancing and um, competed against Bill and Bobby Irvin in the late 60s and early 70s. And uh, the duels between the two couples are still legendary. Um, it's unfortunate now because dancers don't really, from the current, you know, uh, from where we are at the moment, they, they don't probably know some of the, the icons in the past, but um, Peter and Brenda were legendary. And um, so Tony approached Brenda and Brenda said, yes, sure, I'll, I'll coach you. Um, and Carol and I were the only juvenile couple that Brenda ever, ever taught. Um, Brenda really just focused on coaching the very top amateurs and pros. Um, so, um, fortunately for Tony, he persuaded Brenda to, to take us on under her <laughs> wing. And um, so from there we did, we did, you know, extremely, extremely well. So that was my kind of journey into ballroom dancing because it had it not been for my dad's promotion and Sharon being in my class, et cetera. So it's funny how, you know, life changes yes. um, and uh, different connections that you can make. Well, and, and how oftentimes it's not until many years later that we have the hindsight to say just how many things had to line up in our lives to get absolutely. to the point that we needed to be at. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, I'm, of course, I'm very fortunate that, that I'm on the path, I'm on the journey that I am right now. We do have uh, one question from our U.S. Oh. audience in the chat. Uh, Matthew would like to know, uh, isn't, isn't Slough the setting for the British version of The Office? So putting, putting British cities into context a little bit. Uh, I do not know the answer to that. It could well be. I am not familiar with that particular comedy series. Um, but... Uh, yeah, and I have no idea whether or not the Slough Community Centre still exists because I haven't haven't visited that area for for well since so, so I was with this with the school. So we'll we'll have but, to look it up after the fact. We'll have indeed, to fact check yeah. it. Google. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> well, excellent. So, uh, youth uh, amateur program in the UK. Yeah. Uh, how did we get from dancing as a youth and in, in the juvenile categories? Um, in the UK to now being a, a recognized top instructor in the US? Well, um, my coach, Brenda, um, sadly passed away um, in November of 1979. And I was about 14 at the time. And I just decided that um, I was just gonna focus on my schoolwork and focus on my O-levels. Um, which are examinations that you took when you were 16. Um, and that's what I did. And so I took a break from dancing for about seven years. Um, I, I still had itchy feet, so to speak, during that period. I was still attending competitions and stuff, but um, I wasn't actively looking for a partner anyway. I decided that I really wanted a return. And uh, so I had a couple of amateur partners um, and I just decided because it was difficult because I'm very tall and slim 
um, getting a partner that was um, the right height and the right ability and the rest of it was quite difficult in those days. And so I had always wanted to, to teach. And so I made the decision to turn professional. So I started um, studying uh, and took my first professional degree with the ISTD in Latin American dancing. And that happened in December of 1989. So, um, and then uh, through the studio that uh, I was affiliated with, um, I met somebody who um, suggested, oh, you might want to go to America and put me in touch with um, somebody else who put me in touch with a couple that ran a studio in Florida, in uh, Fort Myers area in Florida. So I went to the studio for about a week and to see whether or not I would like it. And um, I didn't. Um, the, the clientele, so to speak, the, the, the average age of the students was probably about 75. Um, and uh, it just wasn't, I don't know, apart from the humidity, which I've never experienced before. I, always, I remember getting off the US Airways flight at uh, Fort Myers and getting onto the jet bridge and just being hit this wall of like humidity. And it was, uh, it was really quite unexpected. And- um, Well, and I imagine uh, too coming um, from, as I say, I imagine too coming from a very like formal structured uh, uh, youth oriented program in the UK to suddenly having your first American experience be in Florida of all places, which I love Florida, but it's a little bit of a culture shock. Let's be honest. Yeah, <laughs> people do love Florida and of course it's very popular. And so I'm not, you know, saying nothing negative, but for me at that time, it was, it was, um, it, it, it was uh, not something that I could see myself, you know, living there. Um, the humidity did bother me. It doesn't so much now. I it's not to it. But uh, yeah, so that unfortunately didn't didn't work out. And um, I knew somebody in LA uh, who was looking for an amateur partner, and so she although as a pro, she invited me to spend um, some time with her, which I did just to kind of like seek out the LA scene and kind of just to kind of get to know people, etc. And uh, I got to know somebody else who had a lesson with Glenn Weiss and Glenn was teaching this pro from Northern Virginia. And so basically, um, I, I obtained the information and contacted this dancer, Stacy, and I moved to the United States, um, and um, this was in the early 90s, and uh, to, to train and to partner her, and that didn't last, and then I just decided to really focus on my own education and building up my pro -am base, um, building up my teaching business as well, so that's essentially what I did. I had a couple of partners after that. Last partner was Wendy Davies, um, who starts with Jonathan Wilkins, and that was about 20 years ago now. And so I retired from Pro Pro in 2000 and um, then really ramped up my pram business. So that's kind of where I got to. And then I retired from Pro Am in September of 2018, having uh, won the World Championship um, uh, and competing at UCC, made, made finals, etc. So and now I'm in Northern California. <laughs> <laughs> it all comes for full circle. Yeah. Indeed. Yeah. And I shall tell you a little story actually about this. Um, before I moved to America, before I even thought about moving to America, um, one of my coaches saw a clairvoyant. And she said, Oh, you must see this woman. So I made an appointment to go see her. And she said that I would be living in California at some point in the future. And it okay. turned out to be a, you're also pretty other things that, 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 that uh, were, were accurate as well. So anyway. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I like it. Well, and um, 
I imagine too that having all of those different experiences, being mm -hmm. in youth, then coming and teaching while also competing as a pro and then building out your pro-am base. I mean, that has to set you up for a great foundation of understanding in addition to all mm -hmm. of your certifications and your formal education with um, ISTD and with DaVita to I, have a really well-rounded view when you step out onto the floor as a judge to, to, to know what you're looking for and to have a, a better understanding of where each dancer is in their understanding, I imagine. Mm. And I think really it comes down again to making sure that you have a very, very good foundation of ball dancing. And I'm very, very happy to say that I have, I have had an excellent foundation. Um, I had two coaches, when primary coaches, when I was a juvenile, one for ballroom, which was Brenda, and one for Latin, which was Robert O'Hara. And both were the best in the business, in my opinion. Um, and they instilled discipline, they instilled the correct, the correct technique. Brenda particularly was big on feet. Um, and, you know, if ever I missed a foot closing in waltz, I would know about it. You know, she would say, you must have neat feet. So, you know, simple things like the precision of the feet closing, which we call blocked feet, um, is one of the inherent characteristics of waltz and yet so many times you see poor foot closures or no foot closures at all so simple things like that um you know are are just uh fundamentally important um so yes you are correct i'm very fortunate i have had a very very strong background i've also worked with a number of different coaches over the time so you kind of get to see their opinion. And I've always been uh, a believer, particularly when it comes to pro-am, of having a third eye. Um, you know, no matter how good a pro is, you need a coach there because sometimes what you feel within closed hold is not always what the judges see. Something can feel terrific internally, but you look at it, you know, being videoed or a coach will say, no, this does not look good. Yep. So, um, you know, I greatly value um, having had coaching myself for uh, not only, of course, when I was a pro pro, but also with my, my students as well. Well, and for, for a little bit of context, um, for those that are, are either listening to this later in the podcast or, or live with us in the chat, um, you have been that third eye for, for myself and for my students recently. Um, well, it's been a year now. Oh, my goodness. Um, but, but having you in the room and getting that extra coaching, not, not only for my students, but also for me just personally trying to continue my education is so helpful for that, that very same reason. When we're instructing a student and we're in frame with them, we're going off of what does it feel like, right? Does this feel right. like all of the other experiences that I've had? Does this feel different? Can I, is there a hesitation? Is there something out of place? But we can't step back and then also see what it looks like when it's moving uh, from an outside perspective, outside of filming. But we know that film doesn't tell you the whole story, right? It's very no. hard to pick apart video in the same way that you can being in the same room. Um, during that coaching experience with you, you had mentioned to me that you were still going out and working with other instructors yourself to, to get your own education, even at your level. So I think that that transitions really well into talking about um, no matter if you're a beginner and intermediate and advanced or a very advanced instructor, how, how can we continue to recenter ourselves and put the importance on going back to to the basics and focusing on that at, at whatever level we are mm -hmm. well yeah you're right um I, I i i'm a firm believer of continuing education um because the dance industry is such that you can never know everything you know it, you're on this this continual learning path um, so yes, I, I still go back to England and I get my coaching because I want to know whether I agree or disagree, what the latest teaching techniques are, how I can improve my own coaching, what 
tidbits of information I can glean, what can I use, what can I translate, what's going to be valuable um, for, for me uh, to teach my own students and to teach other couples and to teach other pros. So um, I'm a huge believer of continuing education, whether it's getting coaching or whether it's continuing your dancing degrees with whichever society that you're with. Um, and certainly at the moment, I've noticed with the current situation we're in, which I know we're not going to get into today, um, there has been an uptick in interest uh, from professionals that are interested in getting theory coaching. And that's something that I specialize in um, for, you know, either I, I, I work with candidates that are training for either DVDA or the USISTD. Um, and uh, so, um, so I ha there has de definitely been more interest recently uh, with, of course, a lot of people have more time on their hands. Um, but going back to your, 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 your part of your question about the importance of basics, um, I think most top pros um, would agree that it's very important to not only practice your competitive routines, but to practice basic material as well. When I was competing professionally um, in the 90s, um, up to 2000, the USISTD ran three competitions a year, and they always had a professional basics division. Mm -hmm. And most of, if not all of the pros, whether it was standard or Latin, would compete not only in the open but also in the professional basics and i think um this was very very valuable and it was very interesting because some of the couples that would do relatively well in the open division would not play so well in the closed division and what, what i mean by um, basics it was it was close to the best you could dance bronze silver or gold but you couldn't dance above gold that's what i mean by basics competition um, I think there's only one event now that I'm aware of, there may be more, and that's Virginia State that also continued that tradition. Um, but I, I, again, you can all, I mean, you can spend years on a feather step and reverse turn and three step. You can spend years on the swing of a one, two, three, and a natural turn. Um, and so to have some basic material that you can practice i think is is very 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 valuable absolutely do. absolutely and yes i think you're absolutely right going back to heel leads and driving or closing your feet if you're in bronze or you're in gold um if you are doing rhythm or latin working on rumble walks for hours and hours and hours <laughs> working on your box step in rhythm and etc cetera, etc cetera. but yeah i mean yeah you can you and, and it's interesting because i find that one of the peculiarities between standard and latin and we know that they're two different dance forms but one of the peculiar peculiarities is that i find that a lot of women a lot of females will work a lot on rubber walks and it's emphasized a great deal. Mm -hmm. And yet when it comes to ballroom, the equivalent, which would be the backward walking action and the forward walking action is not practiced nearly as much. Nope. And I think even kind of like when you are learning the basics, it's very important to be able to implement and to execute yes. the correct backward walking action and that is where I would say you want to start is start with that and if you are a student um, I would highly encourage you to ask your teacher to drill this into you and I know when I have a beginning student in either standard or uh, smooth I would spend time before learning any pattern, just by going through that backward walking action, forward walking action, mm -hmm. because it it's inherent to every dance in standard. Yep. And who, for that matter? Yes. Uh, so um, I, I think that's a very, very um, 
necessary um, drill. Yes. Well, and I think too, just to, just to add to that, um, most of my students are are older. Most of my students are doing this from either hobby perspective or competitive dance is a secondary focus. It's not necessarily the primary driver. Um, but what I hear often from leads is, oh, I don't need to worry about, I, I don't need to practice my backward step because I'm only ever traveling forward if I'm doing standard or smooth, which just factually isn't correct, right? If you're doing a box step yeah. you, in place, you're going forward half the time and backwards half the time. And on the flip side, I hear from my ladies very often, oh, I don't need to worry about going forward because I'm always going backwards. It's like you have to cross train your body so that you can go forward and backwards and left and right in equal measure because we use those four actions in every step that we take in dance, mm -hmm. regardless That's of whether you're the lead or the follow. And I think, you know, it's true followers will move backwards more than what leaders will. I mean, that's the nature of the beast, so to speak. So that is that. But there are opportunities when, as a follower, that you will be moving forward and you will have to take a cue to um, So, um, you know, and I see that a, a lot. You know, uh, I'll give an example. Um, in standards, in waltz, for example, natural spin turn, four, five, six, reverse turn, the number of times that a heel lead from the follower is not taken on that that um, that fourth step of the four, five, six of the reverse turn. Um, so, um, yeah, it is important. And then when you get to, for example, in Sasha Foxtrot with a reverse wave, the follower has to take a number of heel leads in a row. Mm -hmm. So, um, I think uh, it is important to get used to moving backwards and forwards, irrespective of whether you are a leader or a follower. Absolutely. I've got a little bit of background noise, so that's why I'm muting myself when I'm not talking. Um, <laughs> no, I, I think you. I think that's absolutely correct, um, especially for follows. I, I think it's interesting that you pointed out that we do. Uh, most women spend hours and hours and hours warming up doing rumba walks, but very infrequently do you see those same um, uh, female students doing standard lines and doing heel leads going forwards or heel, or, or, uh, heel releases coming backwards. Um, do you have any tips or tricks for instructors that are trying to instill that mindset in their students? So anything from an instructor standpoint where you can, where you've had success conveying the importance of that to a student that's maybe hesitant to practice it in the same, in the same manner? Um, what I would say is that um, backward walking action for a follower is quite difficult, um, particularly when you're when you're wearing a competitive shoe, where you're wearing a court shoe, where you're wearing you know two two and a half or even three inch heels. Um, believe it or not, um, and Brenda, I have pictures where she's wearing these very thin stiletto heels, three inch heels. Um, so it is very, very difficult because your weight has to go through that tiny surface area when you're rolling your body weight through the heel. And that's very difficult. Um, so I think it's important to um, get students to wear a jazz shoe or something that's very flat, that has a very, very low heel, minimal heel, uh, because it, it is a lot easier. There's no question about it. Um, and to, 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 to really also understand the importance of where the center weight or middle weight position or full extent of the stride means with the same thing, where that point is. Um, because often when your feet are passing, for example, like box drop, we have to also understand where ultimately we're trying to move the body weight to. Um, and I think sometimes we don't spend long enough on the journey of the weight transference from foot to foot. We are in a, a bit of a, a rush 
to transfer weight from foot to foot. So it's important to understand that point where your weight is centrally divided between the heel of the front foot and the toe of the back and to get used to that point because that often is the destination of weight. The destination of weight is not always to the foot. It depends on what you're, you're doing, obviously. Um, but I think to, to get that feeling of, of where the weight is at that precise moment when you are at that split weight position is very important. And also to be very sensitive to be physically um, and mentally aware of, of the fact that the heel of the back foot must not lower too quickly. Um, that is a big thing. You know, if you look at any of the descriptions of the backward walk, it will say something like, the back heel must lower with control, it must lower slowly and with control. Mm -hmm. Because once that heel does lower too quickly, the weight will then move to the foot too fast. And then it will pull the person moving forward. So I think that's, that's um, very, very important. Um, and I think also, it's good when a follower actually dances the forward walk and the teacher will dance the backward walk mm -hmm. and the teacher assumes they're a bad student possibly <laughs> and the, t the, the actual um, student is the teacher so there's good you know there's a, a, a role reversal and where even if you're in a kind of a very open hold if the if the teacher were to actually trance away back too fast or to lower the back heel too quickly how that pulls the weight of the person how it would pull the student moving forward so i think role reversal mm -hmm. um, is very very important for that and i think role reversal is important for everything in actual fact when i was i used to run a number of group, group classes uh, a few years ago and i would actually have role reversal classes so all the men had to dance as follower and all the women had to dance as leader. And it was only, it was just very basic steps. It wasn't anything difficult. But um, I find that you really learn so much more about your own role when you're in the opposite role. Yes. So that's a very, I think that's a very, very good teaching tool because we know when you're dancing as follower, you sometimes don't realize when you're heavy or your sides collapse or you transfer weight too quickly or your head weight is in the wrong position or you're not counterbalancing and all the rest of it. And I think if if the teacher were to, to, to take hold as follower where the student is, is the leader from here and demonstrate what it feels like when something does go wrong, when any of those aforementioned elements go wrong, it really makes it a lot clearer. So, so I, I, you know, I, again, I'm a, a big fan of role reversal. I think it's a very, very good teaching skill to have. I 100% I agree. I think um, swapping lead and follow positions and putting mm -hmm. students in an, in uncomfortable positions where per perhaps they've never experienced it from the follower's perspective or they've never thought about mm -hmm. what the leader needs mm -hmm. to do in this situation mm -hmm. um, is a great instructional tool and a great learning tool. Um, if you are a student that really wants to take your um, understanding of the dance to the next level, spend a couple weeks learning the opposite the opposite role and being in that position and getting a better understanding of it. I think the other thing that you, you spoke about um, relating to your spine position and, and your weight and your foot position and the foot action um, goes back to something that I've been working with my students on the last couple of weeks, which is just body awareness. You know, how mm -hmm. can, if, if you start from a stopping standpoint and imagine a marker on the floor, can you, ac can you accurately place the marker that is your forward step? Or do you yeah. know where you're going to end every single time you do a promenade turning left in tango? Can you yeah. accurately guess how close you're going to get to that wall or the chair if you're doing a natural yep. turn? Because if you can't yep. answer those questions, that means that you need to do that same pattern a million times until you know. Yes. Or, you know, exactly where does your elbow extension need to be if you're holding frame? Is it too low? Is it too high? What does that mean that your shoulder is feeling like? Having that yep. that internal awareness and also that spatial awareness is really so crucial when it comes to floor craft and dancing with a partner. Yeah, yeah, there are, there are you know, in a very kind of rudimentary 
um, sense, there are three vital elements that you have to be aware of. Uh, one is internal, so a feeling of, you know, and, and I think internal also, um, we're now starting to get into the sixth sense, which is kinesthetics mm -hmm. um, and uh, the Alexander technique. And I'm not going to go into that, but um, I think that's a very valuable avenue for teachers to possibly um, look at because uh, the Alexander technique and Braum dancing, there are a lot of similarities. Um, but, you know, being aware of, you know, if I close, if I close my eyes and I take, I take a hold and if I raise my right arm, which I know is too high, and move that right arm and hand nearer to my body, I know precisely when my finger is going to touch my nose. So, and that's what we call the sixth, sixth um, sense, which is uh, kinesthetics. And it's about the relationship of one body part to another. So I know approximately how far away my right hand is to my right side. I know the the angle, I know how far my left hand is near to my face. Often when we take hold, we take hold and we, we don't really have that awareness. We just don't, we take hold and that's it. But, and so sometimes when there is a change in, 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 in the frame for whatever, we're just not aware of it. Um, and so I think kinesthetic sense is, is, is um, very, very interesting. It's a very interesting um, theory. Um, so, yeah, so having a lot of self-awareness is very important. So you, you've got to be internally aware. You've got to be externally aware of your partner. But often when we dance, we are sometimes more externally aware than what we are internally mm -hmm. because of the touch that we have. Yeah. Um, so, so that's the big thing. And then the other external is the music, because at the end of the day, we're trying to actually dance with somebody to music. And often we are not, when it comes down to much high level of musicality and characterization of the dance, we're not listening enough to the melody. It's the melody that really brings out the nuances, it brings out the feelings, et cetera, et cetera. And I think often we're not we're not listening to to the music enough. So external music, external partner, internal yourself. Love it, love it. Um, we did have a question from a, a little bit back um, from the chat, yeah. which is if video isn't sufficient. What's the correct approach since in-person is so much more difficult now and, and in some areas of the country still not an option? Um, for me personally, I wouldn't say that, that video doesn't work. It's just not going to get you the whole vision, right? Um, in, in a couple previous episodes, I, I think it was James's episode, I mentioned that you know, your value for dollar for instruction goes so much farther in a private instruction than it does in group classes. Even if you are in person taking those group classes, you aren't going to get the same quality of instruction in a group class environment that you would in, in a one-on-one -on -one private lesson. Um, the same goes for video versus in person. You can still learn a whole lot from video instructions. And actually, personally, I just um, purchased the video instruction from the mastery camps, mm -hmm. um, from Slavic and, and Marjana's uh, mastery camps online, which obviously normally in Vegas, not an option this year. Um, yeah. So I'm looking forward to learning what I can from those instructors. The thing with video is it just, it doesn't show the full breadth of of the shapes and the experience you lose some quality you lose some detail so it's not to say that video isn't an option it's a great option right now it's just i would not learn i would not encourage a student to learn solely from video instruction what's what's your kind of take on that yeah i think videos can be uh quite valuable but you're right they 
they lose something in translation, so to speak. So I often find that when I look at videos and um, supposedly technique um, lectures, for example, that uh, there are there can be some very interesting and some very um, valuable uh, points made, but how do you apply them? What are the rules? You know, what are the exceptions to the rules? Um, so sometimes it can be a little bit vague in terms of the rules that are being taught. Um, uh, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult. What I would say is that with FaceTime and Zoom now being more popular than ever, particularly Zoom, that if you do have, if you have looked at a lecture or looked at something online, you then follow that up with your teacher. Mm -hmm. um, I know that's not, the, the, you know, the ideal thing, the ideal thing is to be there in a studio environment with your actual, with your pro, but at least then um, you can go through the, um, the lecture with your pro and look at how you can implement it within your own dancing, look at the, you know, the always, there are always exceptions to rules. And that's the thing, what, did it, what, is, what is the exception to the particular rule that's being taught? Mm -hmm. So um, I think probably that would be the way of, of following up from looking at one of these, um, you know, videos. Yep. Well, and, and I, think, I think that's a good point that there's always the exception to, to the rule. And the technique that works for a pro dancer of a certain experience level and a, a certain height and just a certain physicality is not going to work on everyone. You know, going going back to your experience in um, yep. in Florida, if yep. you have a large uh, population of a re retirement community or retirement age individuals, certainly a lot of the the students that I'm currently working with. Um, I'm not going to teach the same rumble walk to you that Yulia right. dances with Ricardo. Yeah. It, it biomechanically, everyone's bodies and everyone's it's, injuries right. are different. Yep. So yeah, it's a great learning tool. It's a great uh, opportunity to learn information and then ask follow-up questions when you yeah. do have your regular instructor in front of you. And I think in many, when it comes to technique in ballroom dancing, it's akin to politics because there are so many different ways often of dancing a particular figure. Yep. And you're absolutely right. It really depends on so many factors um, that you've already mentioned. Um, it also depends upon the range, the flexibility that an individual has, um, balance, uh, all, all sorts of things. Height, you mentioned, physicality, arm length, um, injury, for example, how strong muscles are to begin with. So um, you can't teach the same technique to every single person. It's just not possible. You have to learn to be adaptive. And, you know, I'm working myself on a technique book uh, for standard. Um, and it's on the, the how, how we approach figures from a competitive point of view, not from the way it was written in 1930, for example. Um, and, and there are many ways to execute the, the same figure. You know, I'll give an example. The chassis from promenade position, for example, this is now international bronze. Uh, if you dance the whisk into a progressive chassis from promenade position, there are a minimum of four different ways that the follower can actually break down the turn and to dance that figure, just in terms of turn alone. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, yes, some of the figures, sorry, some of the, some of the ways I would not teach to a beginner, uh, and, and again, you've got to be careful how, how and what you teach because certain techniques are just way too difficult for that student to grasp and for them to attain within 
a reasonable period of time. Mm -hmm. um, so I think you've got to be very, very careful. And, you know, of course, myself, having taught for so many years, you know, you're, you, you're constantly introduced to different ways of dancing a particular figure, whether or not you agree with it, whether or not you dance it yourself when you're competing, but, uh, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm like a, a sponge when it comes to knowledge. I love to know <laughs> how a figure can be taught. You know, you know, how do you teach this when I go to England for coaching myself? You know, what is the latest way of teaching this? Because as we know, dancing has evolved a lot. When you look at today's dancing compared with dancing, say, the 50s, it's, it's, and then when you can compare it to the 1930s, it's, it's vastly, vastly different. Mm -hmm. Um, there's one thing though, it's interesting because I was researching the double reverse spin, which is a bronze international waltz figure. Mm -hmm. And the double reverse spin was um, invented by a guy called Maxwell Stewart. Okay. Maxwell Stewart um, won the first ever World Professional Boring Championship mm -hmm. um, in 1924. And he introduced the double reverse spin at those championships. And oh. he danced two a pencil double reverse spin, though two in a row. And apparently it caused an absolute sensation when it was in introduced. The, the, the crowd went wild. And what's very interesting about um, Maxwell Stewart is that if you go onto YouTube, you can see him dancing. And it's quite fascinating because although dancing was in its infancy, and the hold is much more social, it's much more upright, it's almost like Argentine tango, it's very more intimate, because of course, competitive ballroom dancing was based on social dancing, and there was, there was not a, a huge amount of difference between the two in those days. Um, but the quality of movement is really quite lovely to see. Same thing when you look at Alex Moore, some, some old videos of, of Alex Moore dancing as well. Beautiful, beautiful quality of movement. I think sometimes that's what we lack today. You know, everybody's so concerned about dancing the latest figure and getting these really unusual shapes and stuff. Um, I think quality of movement today, I would much rather see a beautiful feather reverse turn three step than some exotic configuration of, of, of figures that is over choreographed and where the timing is just, you know, so many, how many syncopations can you fit in a bar of music? Yeah. So to me, I would, I would much prefer to see quality over quantity. So I'm going to use that to transition now to the slightly controversial subject of um, smooth versus standard or standard versus smooth. Mm. Um, very, I, I, from a explaining to students perspective, um, I, I often say, you know, there's international standard and there's American smooth. And in both, you have waltz, tango, foxtrot, Viennese waltz. We add a P body occasionally in American right. smooth, and we add the quick step in international standard. Mm -hmm. International standard, you got to stay in hold and you got to stay in frame the whole time. American, right. we can we can break it up. We can make it jazzy. We can make it feel Broadway, ho uh, Hollywood. Um from a foundational perspective, from a first year of instruction, speaking solely from a competitive perspective, because from a social social perspective, we, we change a whole bunch of rules. We break a lot of rules. But if you were taking a competitive student that came in and said, I, I have a long-term goal of I want to make championships, I want to make finals. First year, do you teach your students anything different between smoother standard or is it pretty much the same foundations across the board? Well, um, the, uh, and, 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 okay, so I should have really said that at the very beginning of this interview that my opinions that I express are purely my own. Yeah. So even though I am registered with the NDCA and I am a member of the USISDD, and NADTA, and also I'm examined, as you mentioned, with Divida, I do not represent any of those organizations. So what I'm about to say is what I purely believe myself. Um, so we know that uh, um, two or three years ago that 
a whole lo load of rules were applied, new rules were implemented by the NDCA when it comes to bronze and silver uh, pro-am competitions um, for smooth. And as you know, you have to dance in close hold for a minimum of four bars of music at the very beginning of each dance. And then you have to have a minimum of, I think it's 50% uh, enclosed uh, within, the within the first minute of music. That's 12, an additional 12 oh, bars for the first right. minute. Well, yes, thank you, you're correct. Um, it's it's only because uh, I have had that memorized for the last year once yeah, that rule yeah. came into effect. Um, so um, you can argue that when a smooth bronze waltz competition is on the floor, that judges are looking at who has the best closed hold not only best closed hold, but best closed movement and all the rest of it. So is it really a smooth competition or is it standard competition? I know that after those four bars, you can, you know, you can open up and do things, but I know there was a lot of concern that judges would initially be marking on the closed hold work like we would in standard and not on, on the smooth. So that is a little bit controversial. Um, I think it, I, I can understand the importance of making sure that people do have good closed work in smooth. I don't know that you should have to start out with it. I think maybe you, you have to maybe dance 12 bars, for example, um, throughout the, the, you know, the, the minute of, of the routine, uh, and not necessarily start out with it. I don't know. Um, but I think it's good to emphasize basics. I think it's good to em emphasize fundamental actions because smooth does come from closed hold. And, I, and I, I remember when I first came to the United States, the very first competition I attended was in 1989, California Star Ball. And it's the first time I was exposed to American smooth. And I was there in the evening, I remember, because Igor and Irina Suvorov were still amateurs at that time and had just moved to the United States. So this is going back a long time ago. And anyway, uh, so I was watching the um, open smooth, and I have to be honest with you, I was not very impressed um, at all. Um, and partly that was due to the fact that closed hold was not was was not like it is now so you see that the tough couples in smooth now and their closed hold is very very good and you look at nick and victoria and they you know their their standard portion of their smooth is is quite at a high level it's quite lovely to watch but in those days you know the, the closed hold was you know was not so good let's just say that so I think, I think um, you know, closed hold is important. Um, and of course, nowadays, you know, we have the rule we have to abide by uh, when it comes to um, bronze and silver smooth. Um, going back to question, if I had, if I was training someone for a competition in smooth, obviously want to make sure that you adhere to, to the rules and regulations, but I'd also keep the routine relatively simple. Just have a long and a short side and repeat again. And it's better to focus on that than, you know, three or four long sides and a very long routine. You don't need that. The judges only will be looking at you for a relatively small period of time, assuming that there are other competitions on the floor. So they have very little time to assess. So even if you repeat halfway through the the, uh, flo the floor, halfway around the floor, that is fine. Mm -hmm. Again, I think quality over quantity is very, very important. And, you know, when you have maybe like a hand-to-hand, -hand, back back-to-back or something in waltz in bronze, again, just keep it very clean, keep the styling very readable. You don't have to do anything exotic with the arms for the time being. You can always add that. So I think... You know, it's it's like building a foundation. You've got to get the foundation right. 
So just having just a, a, a bare skeleton of the routine where you have all the necessary elements that you're showing to the judges, where you can dance it well, where I will always remember this, and this is going to sound very pessimistic. One of the coaches that I went to when I was, a, when I was an amateur was called Brian Allen. And Brian said to me, the least offensive couple on the floor wins. Kimberly and I were just talking about this last week. Really, yeah. The least offensive couple on the floor wins because judges are looking at, they're searching for mistakes. And that's what we do as a coach. We're looking for errors all the time. So the fewer that you can make, the more likely that you will do well. Mm -hmm. So just by having that kind of just simple routine, dance very, very well, I think is much better than trying to have some over choreographed routine with advanced stylings, which are not going to look too, too good. So and I advise that for all the, all the dances, for sure. So, so I want to, I want to kind of take that, con that, that concept and just kind of wrap it back around to the beginning, um, before we end today, which is, yeah. I feel like, um, I know in my own instruction and in my own dancing and I, and I see it in students all the time. I feel like instructors talk about it all the time when we're, we're discussing our successes and our frustrations with students, <laughs> which is. Mm -hmm. In the beginning, when we have a beginner student that's just walking in off the street, they're excited and they're energetic and they're sponge and they just want to take and absorb all of the information possible. And there's not an ego to a beginner student. It's right. it's OK. If you want me to do 45 minutes of drills, I'll do 45 minutes of drills. If you want me to hold a shoebox on my elbow and just stand in frame, I'll hold an, uh, I'll hold a shoebox on my elbow when frame. And then once we get a little bit of knowledge under our belt, the ego kicks in. We go, okay, well, I'm no longer a beginner student. I don't need to do those drills. I don't need to focus on on my, you know, my left box turn or my natural turn or my, my reverse or my feather. I, I don't, I, I've done that. I can do that. I, I'm not a beginner anymore. And then there's a period of time where we've got that ego and then we all become advanced dancers or instructors or wherever life leads us and we go oh no there is so much more that I need to work on back at square one because I'm not closing my feet consistently my frame isn't locked in the entire okay. minute and a half so how mm -hmm. do you address that middle section okay so I'm going to tell you two stories actually I'm a little bit like a raconteur sometimes um I remember having a lesson with Brenda Winslade and it was at their studio called Winston's um, in Cheen and Peter was teaching at the same time and he was teaching Rich and Janet Gleave who were the current world professional standard champions. The entire lesson was primarily spent on Peter improving Janet's heel turn. So I think, <laughs> you know, there's something to be said about that. I have another story that I'll tell you. And when I was, when I was uh, getting coaching in England with my first pro partner, um, we took some lessons with um, Michael and Dickie Barr. And I had a lesson with Michael and we were dancing waltz and we danced our waltz routine. And for the entire two lessons, Michael spent the time working on my one, two, three of the natural turning loss. So <laughs> and I can tell you, I come away from that thinking I could not dance again. Um, so I understand that it can be very frustrating and I understand that, um, you know, we have certain expectations and we gain confidence. Sometimes we can be overconfident and our ego, unfortunately, can get the better of us. Um, but I, I also think it's very important to be humble and to be receptive and to never forget the importance of the foundation, the importance of your basics, the correct way. You know, even if you practice, for example, I don't have a very big space here in my living room, and a lot of people don't. They don't have the benefit of the ball in the house. 
but just to practice some basics. Even if you practice a box step, a left box step and a right box step, and working on the correct footwork and not in the correct footwork, the correct articulation. You know, sometimes what I find particularly fascinating when I watch Latin American dancing, as well as rhythm as well, is to see how the ladies use their legs and their feet. Do the feet speak to me? Do they ooze this sensuality, this musicality, this beautiful shaping, the ins the instep, the toe, the inside edge of the toe, the beautiful action of the, of the leg, the way that weight is transferred, the straightening of the leg. All of that, I, when it starts at a the highest, highest level, it is breathtaking to watch. And the same thing with standard. I, 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 I love to see really beautiful usage of the feet. And if you look at all the world champions, particularly in standard, the, the way that they use the feet, there is such a precision to it. It's really quite lovely, lovely to watch. So never forget that ballroom dancing starts from your feet upwards. Never neglect the way that you use your feet and you transfer weight. You can always, always work on that. Love it. I love it. Well, thank you so much, Ian. Um, thank you very much for this opportunity, this platform to be on this podcast. I'm normally quite shy, so I don't normally express my opinions very well in the open, but anyway. <laughs> well, it was such a pleasure to have you on. Um, if you would like to reach out and follow Ian or to contact him uh, to see about coaching, um, you can find him at iankgillette.com. Uh, that is on screen now for those of you that are watching this on YouTube, or it'll be in the description box uh, everywhere that this podcast is available. Um, I'm Samantha. Uh, you can find me at lovelivedance.com. Uh, you can follow this podcast at Ballroom Chat on both Instagram and Facebook, or you can go to ballroomchat.com to find all of the previous podcasts. Um, Next week, we are going to be actually taking a week off from the podcast. It is the first anniversary of my 29th birthday on Monday, so I am taking the day off. <laughs> um, um, but uh, uh, the week following that, so it'll be, what is that, the 26th? second i believe um we have michael johnson from dance magic and the uh, magic for life podcast coming on to chat about that so very excited to have him on in two weeks time um if you are watching this on youtube please take a second to give the video a thumbs up say something positive in the comments if you are not already subscribed please subscribe and hit that bell for notifications so that you know every time that we post or every time we go live for this podcast uh we are trying to get to 100 subscribers if we can get to 100 subscribers then we can be youtube.com slash love live dance and that would make everybody a lot happier to try and find this podcast <laughs> so 100 subscribers is the goal um so thank you guys so much for supporting love you very much uh stay safe stay positive and i hope to see you dancing thanks guys bye